Well, welcome along to Unbelievable. It is, of course, the first Saturday of 2010. So, a very happy new year to you wherever you're listening.、Uh, it's great to have you with me this Saturday afternoon. Perhaps you're listening live across the nation via our DAB service or in London on medium wave.、Um, perhaps you're listening across the world via our internet podcast, premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Glad to have you with me. And I do hope 2010 brings many good things your way. Well,、uh, we've got something. Good coming your way this January.、Um, unbelievable.、Um, looking to do something a little bit different as we are preparing to screen.、Uh, we're hoping at least, we're still ironing out the details, but we're hoping to, to have the first UK screening of the controversial film Expelled. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a film that looks at the whole issue of intelligent design. It caused quite a stir in America last year when it was released across cinemas there. It's going straight to DVD here in the UK, but、uh, Premier are in discussion. Uh, to actually put on a screening, and、uh, we'd like to invite you along.、Uh, now, we haven't got all the details worked out yet, but we're looking at somewhere near the end of January, so not long, and、um, we're going to be putting up details soon on our website. So do check back at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable in the coming week, and we hope to have something up there as soon as we can. And、uh, we'll be, of course,、um, in the spirit of unbelievable, hosting a debate on the whole issue of intelligent design, particularly the theme of the film. That those who put forward that particular view are being expelled from academia, from the scientific community. Um, so,、uh, again, do check back in the coming week for details on that screening. If you're able to attend, it would be lovely to have you there and to meet you.、Uh, premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Well, a show very much in that particular vein coming up for you today.、Uh, it's going to be a fascinating one. Let me tell you what's coming up on the show that gets you thinking. You're unbelievable. <laughs> Yes, this is the, the show that gets you thinking, and today we're thinking about intelligent design. We're asking specifically is life too complex to be the result of purposeless evolution? And we're、um, very honoured to have with us by phone from the States one of the key proponents of intelligent design, William Dembski, known to many as Bill Dembski.、Uh, he's a mathematician, theologian, professor of philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. We're going to be hearing his argument for specified complexity. Why he does believe there is a creative intelligence at work in biology. Opposite him on the show today, Lewis Wolpert, developmental biologist, author, and broadcaster. He's presently an emeritus professor of biology at University College London. He's an atheist. He'll be explaining why he just doesn't buy the intelligent design theory. Do hope you can stay with us right through till 4 30. Or four, even.、Um, <laughs> that's when the show airs till. Um, so, my、uh, sincere thanks to Bill for joining us on the line from the States.、Um, Bill, uh, We've never had you on the show before, though I'm sure many who listen to this show will be aware of your work.、Um, tell us, though, a little bit about your background,、um, your Christian background. Have you, have you always had a Christian faith? No, I、uh, was raised in a largely secular home. I, I did go to a Catholic school and Catholic churches, but it was mainly as a, as a springboard. To academic advancement. So there was,、uh, once I didn't have to go to Catholic Church, I didn't. It wasn't really until later that、uh, I became a Christian, reading the scriptures,、uh, reflecting on the life of Christ.、Uh, so that was,、uh, I was 18 or 19 at the time. And、uh, then since then, actually, the, the whole issue of faith and science was not an issue for me in my conversion. It did become an issue later, though. That's interesting, and perhaps we'll, we'll hear more about that later, perhaps even in, in next week's show when you join us again.、Um, you, you are a Christian. Does your faith come before your science? Well, I, I think the, the connection is dialectical,、uh, and I don't mean to be cute with that, but、uh, in John,、uh, John's Gospel, Jesus is talking to、uh, Nicodemus, who's puzzled about being born again, and Jesus said, If I've told you earthly things and you, and you do not believe, How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And so、uh, we cannot understand the scripture without some rudimentary knowledge of nature. If we don't know what lambs are, we're not going to understand what it means for Jesus to be the Lamb of God. So I think the, they, they work together, and I, I'm, I'm hesitant about saying, well, we have to raise one above the other.、Uh, but they, they do, there has to, I think, be some sort of broad concordism. They have to 
match up in some way. Otherwise, either the faith becomes nonsense or our understanding of nature becomes nonsense. Hmm. Well, um, we'll come to your key argument in a moment, uh, which is the uh, specified complexity argument, and we'll, we'll get into the ins and outs of that. But first of all, Lewis Wolpert joins us. Thank you very much for coming in today, Lewis. Yes, sir. Well, it may be a pleasure. <laughs> we'll see how it goes, I suppose. <clears throat> um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Lewis. You hail, I think, originally from South Africa. Yes, I'm a South African and a Jewish South African. But, um, and I used to, I learned Hebrew as a, a child, and I had a bar mitzvah, and um, I had to say my prayers every night. But by the age of about 15, 16, I found that it didn't really work, that every time I asked God to help me find my cricket bat or my table tennis balls, he didn't help, and I gave it up. I see. Um, did you, at that point, become an, an atheist? Yes, I became an atheist at, at quite an early age. And that was primarily because you just didn't see any evidence that I God was... I couldn't see any evidence for God whatsoever, no. Um, what about your scientific work? Has that sort of served for you to confirm that belief? No, I don't think the scientific work confirms it. I started off as an engineer. I studied engineering in South Africa and then um, later changed to biology at King's College here, here in London. No, no, it, uh, I, it's just that I have no... I'm, I'm going to repeat this a million times, so I might as well say it. I claim there's just no evidence for God, and so I can't take it seriously. OK. Um, you've been involved in debates. Um, we, we, we heard a debate um, at Gunnersbury Baptist Church where sure. you were involved with um, uh, Professor Simon Cowburn, uh, Russell Cowburn even. Russell, um, yeah. And uh, in a sense, do you have more respect for uh, Russell, who believes in theistic evolution, the, the idea that uh, evolution is the truth, um, you know, a true account of what happened biologically, but there's a God, as it were, underneath it than, than you do for someone like Bill, who believes in intelligent design, that actually ev the evolutionary theory is full of holes and, and actually there is a creative intelligence actually involved in the biological process. I'm terribly sorry I don't take either serious in any way whatsoever. So it's not a question of respect. No, they may be very nice people. I've, been, I've not I've met Bill. That's the first time we've spoken. And Russell was a very nice man. His obsession with Christ I found a little disconcert, disconcerting, but I don't take the idea seriously in any way whatsoever. OK. Well, um, well, we'll get into the discussion now. And if you're listening and you'd like to get in touch at any point during today's programme uh, to air your views, I'm happy to read your emails out in following programmes, <laughs> happy to um, listen to your voicemail messages and play those out. The way to get in touch, as usual, is unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Send me a, an email that way. Or you can phone 08456 52 52 52 and select option 8 to leave a voicemail message. Uh, we're talking about intelligent design today. Is there a creative intelligence at work in biology? Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Not the first time we've tackled this subject, so I will put up with the podcast of this programme. Uh, other episodes that deal with intelligent design, uh, do visit that at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. OK, um, Bill, tell us, specified complexity, that's what you're best known for in the field of intelligent design. Now, bearing in mind that I have no degree in mathematics, um, could you, at a level which hopefully I can engage with, explain why you believe that there is good evidence that life, biological life, has to have been designed in some sense. Yeah. Well, let me back up just a little bit. The, the premise of this program is that life is too complex to be the result of purposeless evolution. And I think that uh, where I have a sticking point here is this too complex, because I don't think it's the quantity of complexity, it's the quality of the complexity. And indeed, that's, that's what specified complexity is getting at that there are certain, certain patterns in nature that are going to be best explained as the product of intelligence. And so what, what are those patterns? And the way I got into this was as actually a graduate student in mathematics uh, was at the height of this whole interest in chaos and nonlinear dynamics. And uh, there was a conference uh, convened by Percy Diaconis, a well-known statistician at Stanford, uh, on the nature of randomness, and it got me thinking. Uh, that the broad conclusion of the conference was that we don't know what random, we know what randomness isn't, we don't know what it is. 
And uh, we all have this experience where we'll look at some, let's say, something that looks like an ink blot, and it's, it looks all random, higgledy-piggledy, and then suddenly we see an image there. Maybe it's a cow staring at you or something. And suddenly it comes together, and once you see the pattern, you'll never unsee it again. And it's, it's there objectively. So what are the types of patterns when we see them? We say, oh, we're dealing with an intelligence. Uh, and and that's, that's the issue that, uh, that I addressed in my book, uh, The Design Inference, which came out in 1998 with Cambridge Press. Uh, and so there, there, it seems that there are two things which are involved when we identify the effects of intelligence. With, when we don't know the causal story, okay, and I think this is an important point, design inferences are effects to cause reasoning. We see the effect, but we don't have a video camera running. We don't see who the causal agent or what the causal agent is. And so we're trying to infer back, is it an intelligence or is it blind, purposeless forces. And this is the way we have of carving up reality. Uh, did she fall or was she pushed? We use terms like accident, chance, randomness. On the other hand, we use per words like intention, purpose, and design. So it's a fundamental way we carve up reality. How do we do it, and are there statistical and mathematical ways that we go about doing it? And what I found was just looking at the scientific literature, looking even at how we detect data falsification in science, that there is a way we do it. And it's, so what we need is an, a highly improbable event, but high improbability is not enough because you get out a coin, flip it a thousand times, and you'll witness a highly improbable event. So in addition, you need some salient pattern, and the nature of those patterns, which will point us to intelligence, that, that's the, that was the, the upshot of my work. But we all have this sense. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility of design in biology is certainly there. We can. Uh, Craig Venter has put has encoded his name into the genome. If we found that in nature, we would know that there's intelligent design there. So the question is just, can we eliminate human and alien uh, intelligences and get to some sort of transcendent intelligence? And I think I think we can. I think uh, biology at least has the possibility of exemplifying design. Uh, and uh, and my work at least lays out a method for design detection in this in this. Mm. Uh, concept of specified complexity. Once you have the method, it applies widely, archaeology, forensic science, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, can it apply to biology? The reason it's controversial in biology is because the intelligence in that case would most likely be an unevolved intelligence, which then naturally leads you to some form of transcendence or something that's beyond just brute material processes. Mm. And um, I've, I've heard, I, I saw you put it in some sense like this, um, that, that if you have a letter of the alphabet and you put it down, that's one piece of information. If you put, if, if you know, you r randomly generate a number of letters of the alphabet in a row, um, you have complexity. But what specified complexity is, is when you have something like a Shakespearean sonnet, which ha is complex, but in a very particular way. Is that correct? Right. I mean, uh, I mean, it's, uh, what, what you have is there's, there has to be a, a salient pattern, an independently given pattern. In a sense, we come to it. Nature is giving us a signal. Do those, does that signal pa match patterns that we have in our background knowledge? You have to have intelligence to detect intelligence. If there's a signal coming to you where you have no, no background knowledge, I mean, if uh, we have this experience, we're listening to, to somebody speaking, if we have no, no knowledge of the language, it could just be gibberish. It could just be random noises coming from that person's vocal cords. But if we have the background knowledge, we can tell, in some cases, then if we're actually dealing with intelligent communication. And so that's, yes, that's the idea. The, sort of, the example that I use uh, to try to, to illustrate this in, in, uh, in lectures usually is uh, from uh, the Carl Sagan novel, Contact, in which he you have these radio astronomers, they're looking for signs of intelligence from outer space. They don't have the little green man right here. The little green man presumably is sending radio signals. How do we know that it is that this is an intelligent communication? Well, in the movie, it was, uh, there's a movie based on that novel, uh, you had a long sequence of prime numbers that come in. And so it was a long sequence, so it would be hard to reproduce by chance. So there you have the improbability. And then there's also this mathematically salient pattern. And so when they get that signal, they contact the New York Times science editor and say, we found uh, evidence of alien intelligence. Well, they, that's, that's fiction. Nothing like that has happened in the actual SETI program. But the mere fact that this program continues and that there's this presumption that we do have reliable methods for identifying intelligence uh, suggests that you know, I'm on to something. With mm. 
Well, well, it's fascinating stuff, and um, we'll, we'll continue to delve into it. Uh, Lewis, why don't you believe in this idea of specified complexity? Isn't, isn't it show, all over nature? Everything looks incredibly designed like it was specified. No, no, hold on. There are many questions that I don't understand. There are many aspects I don't understand. Uh, first of all, I need to understand what you mean by design. Remember your ink blot. Was that designed? Would you say, if you look at that ink plot, would you say that was designed? If it's a random ink plot, I would say no. But if it has, if it uh, clearly depicts something... Uh, but it might do so by chance. Level, well, the, that's an issue. I mean, the, Michael Shermer is somebody I debate. Uh, he comes at this as a perceptual psychologist, and he will refer to uh, humans have this, this tendency to impose patterns on things, and so he'll sure. refer to a, a uh, uh, I think, a cheese sandwich with, with an image of the Virgin Mary. Well, you know, we, we all can look at sky formations and say, doesn't that look like Santa Claus? Well, well and good, but if you see uh, in the sky so, uh, letters written clearly, eat at Joe's, then you're going to know that you're dealing with an intelligence. So, that, yes, there's, there's, some, there, there's some clear instances where we'll, we'll certainly be able to detect design, others in which it seems that we're just making it up. But, uh, but it, it seems that we can, we can draw a distinction, and it's the level of specificity, it's the, uh, and, and it, it ties very much into this question of improbability. How improbable is it that this pattern could be matched? And usually in these discussions, the, the question is not one of specification. I mean, Richard Dawkins, for instance, he uses this language of specification. It's the improbability, and that's why he writes a book, Climbing Mount Improbable, because he thinks that these sorts of patterns can be generated through a blind, purposeless evolutionary process. Presumably, Lewis, that's what you believe as well, that what, um, obviously, Bill is seeing as purposed design is, the, is in fact, the product of purposeless evolutionary... Oh, yes, of course, but hold on a second. I'm still not happy with the thing. We're getting a little bit with the thing. And how, what, how do we determine what is intelligent and what is not intelligent? Well... Can you have an unintelligent design? Uh... I think when we're talking design, we're talking, uh, there's a causal story that we're telling, and we're referring it to intelligence. Now, the thing is, the language of design does come up in biology. I mean, Richard Dawkins will, in, on page one of his blind watchmaker, write, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. So, the but, language but you don't need the concept there. intelligence at all. Once well, you have I mean, in, in design, it, you've got everything that you want. No, but, Why but confuse got, it by adding intelligence? He's got, but the design there is, is merely the appearance of design. So the, the word intelligent in front of design is, uh, is an, uh, the adjective is necessary because it distinguishes it from mere appearance, which would allow that it could just be the result of, of a purposeless process. I mean, what, what is intelligence? Intelligence is the causal power that matches means to ends, okay? And that's precisely what you as a, you as a materialistic biologist is denying. Well, no, sorry, <laughs> and just one further question before we proceed. Do you think there's actually a designer? Of course. I, think, I believe there's a designer behind the world. Now, the thing is, designers can operate through surrogate intelligences. I mean, this, yeah. this language of design, I mean, you know, you make it seem as though this is some, some sort of absurd language. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes. Time. Oh, it no, is absurd. You, 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 you yourself are an intelligence. You're requiring intelligence to refute intelligence. I mean... Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a self-referential problem I think you have with all of this. Using poetic phrases like that gets one absolutely nowhere. I'm afraid it explains oh, I, I nothing. Think... Just, just give me a little bit of evidence for a designer. Okay. What we've got, I believe, and I've argued this in peer-reviewed literature, is that we have reliable methods for design detection. Do you have a problem with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? If certain signals came from outer space, could you be convinced that there's an alien intelligence sending... It's not my subject, but I suppose people. I could be, yes. Okay, all right. So, so we're on a slippery slope, thankfully. Okay, so is it possible that biological systems could exhibit the effects of intelligence in a way that would be beyond the remit of purely material, blind, purposeless... Uh, it's the word beyond, because what we know about biology can all be explained in terms of the behavior of cells, and we understand this. Not, not that we know all the answers to all the problems in evolution, is but we understand... Nothing, a, sorry? Is there, nothing that evolu that, is there nothing that biological systems can exhibit 
that would point you to an intelligence, something beyond absolutely our nothing. Our evolutionary. Absolutely well, in, nothing. In that, in that case, how do you have how do you have a scientific theory? Because there's nothing that can refute it. It's as though is 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 Darwin Darwinian evolution and its uh, and its and its development at, to this date. Is it is it an axiom? Is it something that's, that's no? It is pretty well truth? established. No, I suppose well, some. Well, hold on. Well established I... is different from being a necessary truth. If it's pretty well established, that means there, is there anything? Is it on the empirical chopping block? So is there anything that could count against it? I can't think of anything off offhand. No. Well, well, then I think maybe you haven't thought deeply enough. Well, about give me an it. example. Well, I would say you you come at this as an engineer. Okay, you look at these systems. We have to be engineers to understand what's going on inside the cell. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, there's all sorts. There's, there's all. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of signal transduction, sure. information storage, retrieval. All of sure. this, we would not be able to understand this if we were not, if we had not made significant progress in the engineering sciences. So, why mm. is it such a stretch to think that if we find engineering, if we find tremendous nano engineering inside the cell? that there might be actual engineering. Uh, that is not purely the result of this sort of blind, purposeless, step-by-step -step incremental changes, natural selection acting on random variations and other material mechanisms. I'm sorry. I, I, no, I'm, 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 really, I'm really shocked that, you would, that there's nothing that you can think of, no evidence that could count against evolutionary theory. Because oh, yes. No, no, I'm sure. I, I think there could be something. Um, um, say, for example, um, um, I gave birth... Um, um, to a dog, I think that would go very heavily against evolutionary theory. But well, wh wh why but why won't you accept the <clears throat> the idea, um, Lewis, that th that um, the probabilities are simply a against um, the? Well, do you know you don't know what this the being a, an unguided process? That well, I've never heard such nonsense in my life. How do you calculate the probabilities? Well, what we we do there there are certainly we we have methods of calculating probabilities. I think they're more difficult than certainly an example I gave earlier was co tossing a coin. Okay, there we can calculate the probabilities. I think you'd agree with that. So if, when we're looking at biological systems, especially uh, certain polymers, let's say, inside the cell, they're, sure. they're alphabetical characteristics of these. They, there seem to be no bonding affinities uh, with, with uh, let's say, with the uh, DNA bases along a sugar phosphate backbone seems that we can start doing some probability calculations. Now, I think we need to be clear that uh, nobody's cheating in these, but uh, it seems that uh, it seems that we can get at least some baseline probability estimates. And often we don't even need to get exact probabilities; we just need probability bounds. Well, I'm sorry, I don't believe in you that you can estimate the probabilities at all, because you have oh, to. Well, I mean, but so science is in the business of. Dealing with difficult problems. I mean, if you don't have any sort of probabil probabilistic grasp of the situation, it seems to me then you can just uh, invoke a chance of the gap and say, well... Let, let's have you happen. explain why you don't believe you can invoke probability, Lewis. Well, I just don't see... I mean, what, what we, you must realize that the essence of life is cells. And all you have to think about when you think about it is cells. And I cannot think of any estimate of probability which will tell you anything interesting about a cell. I mean, is, is, it does, does a lot of this hinge around DNA for you? No, but, proteins. Pro, I mean, but, but, but you DNA, say... DNA is dead boring. It merely codes for proteins, yes? It provides the code. And how cells behave, and therefore how you behave, you are nothing more than a society of cells. I'm terribly sorry. There's nothing mystical about you. You're just a group of cells, and this group of cells, like you and me, we can gabble because the cells in our brain actually control our muscles. But isn't his point here, and I will let you come oh, in again, Bill. Society, but... I mean, well, there, there's, there's all sorts of tremendous coordination, so I think that really misrepresents what's going on with, with, with higher organisms. Well, but, I mean, if you, if you look, inside, look inside the cell, yes. uh, if, if, if we can get a probability estimate for some feature of the cell, then, but how the could, but, but cell, would... then the entire well, well, let me finish. I mean, if we can get some some estimate, I mean, the estimates like this have been made, uh, and not just by people on my side of this. So you have some estimate for some feature of the cell. Then, if if there's a level of improbability for that feature, then the cell as a whole will be at least that improbable. So and I deny that you can some... estimate this probability. You'll have to tell me well, how you do it and which feature of the cell it has been calculated for. I well, think I mean, it's, uh, it's totally uh, false. You know, I, Okay, we, we, we have corresponded by email. You may remember this about a year ago, and I sent you a copy of a book that I did on the origin of life. Okay, I would I have hated it. If, if you ever if you ever read it, but uh, I did I did email you the like an electronic copy of it. So it does. I can't remember. That, well, 
It's uh, you know, I, I can I can get you the email. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I keep keep very very careful records of all my emails. So uh, so so the thing is, we we have uh, there there are all sorts of people who are a- estimating probabilities. Uh, I've got a one of the the examples uh, I give is uh, uh, there's there's some work of a colleague of mine, Douglas Axe, who's looking at the the evolution of protein folds. And how, because if, if, if these systems evolve, then you've got to go from one type of protein to another, and it's, you have to be able to evolve from one fold to another. And he looks at the, the problem, he, he sets up some probabil- probabilistic estimates. I, I can't get into the details of it all here, but he, he's calculating improbabilities on the level of 10 to the minus 60, 10 to the minus 77, I think. And he's got his calculations yeah. wrong. Well, <laughs> you I have, have to get, I'll have to get, I'll have to get and look at them. It's appeared in JMB, Journal of Molecular Biology. Yes. So, so it's, it's, it's in the peer-reviewed literature, and he's, he's giving probabilistic estimates. I mean, this is something, well, unless, you can, uh, unless you can give some sorts of probabilities to the uh, assigned probabilities to evolutionary processes, you're, I think you're, you're not even dealing with, uh, you, you, don't have a, you don't have an exact science at that point. You're, you're, you're just saying, well, it could have happened or it couldn't have happened. There's no way to assess the, the truth or the falsity well, you can. of these evolutionary processes. Well, you can actually well, you see that you can really... you can see the uh, the, the validity of these processes. You can see that if you actually change the order of bases in the DNA, you'll get a different protein, and it will right. fold in a different who's, way. There's who's, nothing who's, improbable. Who's, 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 who's doing the changing? In this case, an experimenter, or I suppose you can do it uh, through through random means. But, exactly but that. The, well, but the thing is, what, what are you getting out of it? And it's one thing to say that you can get small-scale evolutionary changes, but all of this needs to be coordinated. And if you're talking, I think that this is always this is a consistent criticism of the intelligent design community against the sort of evolution that you're proposing, that, it's, that there's a vast extrapolation that you're doing from the small-scale changes that you can observe experimentally to the large-scale changes which are needed when the, everything is coordinated. And again, I... I, I no, everything is not... We condo- are sorry. merely... A, let me finish with me, that we are merely a society of self. Yes. It's rather that there's a huge coordination of this, that everything has to work together in a concerted... Everything has to be orchestrated. This is... This, there, there, and, and this, to us, actually suggests a higher-level design as well. We, we will so let you re- respond. Really, really, the- that, you are, that, you're, that you're a reductionist in all of this. And, oh, know, yes. There's, there's a lot of mainstream science that's not intelligent design that's anti-reductionist. So, you know, so I, I don't think you speak for, for the consensus even. Here. Let, let, let's just take a quick break here, gentlemen. And um, I'd like to, again, say that if you want to weigh in yourself, then you're welcome to send me an email. That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. We're talking about intelligent design with Bill Dembski, who is a, a, a mathematician, theologian, and professor of philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, best known for um, his proposing the specified complexity argument in intelligent design. And we'll, um, we'll continue to look at his reasons for believing that the level of complexity and the type of complexity we see around us simply doesn't allow for the random purposeless forces, as it were, that um, people who believe in evolution uh, reckon has created it, <laughs> if that's not too wordy a way of putting it. Um, we've got also, of course, Lewis Wolpert in the studio, developmental biologist, atheist, and uh, emeritus professor of biology at University College London. Do join us again in just a few minutes' time. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. We're taking a special look at intelligent design today. Uh, Bill Dembski, who is a key proponent in the intelligent design movement, joins us on the phone from Texas, where he is a professor of philosophy at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And um, he's been describing his argument from specified complexity for intelligent design. Lewis Wolpert, our atheist in the studio, developmental biologist and professor em- emeritus professor of biology at UCL, um, has been uh, arguing against that particular view. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion thus far, gentlemen, though we seem to sort of be at odds at a kind of fairly fundamental point, you know, as to the whole idea of probabilities and whether they, uh, you know, are even worth talking about um, at this level. Um, just before we come on to maybe some of what you've been doing more recently in the last few years, Bill, um, e- evolutionary inf- for- formation, um, or informatics, tell us one of the key things you hear again and again, especially in the, the press, is that intelligent design is basically a cover for smuggling biblical creationism. 
into society, into the classroom, wherever. Um, what do you make to, to that particular um, to that particular uh, belief? And, and Lewis has just said, "Hear, hear." <laughs> but what, what do you make? Well, of that I, I would say nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, I, I get to the UK fairly regularly. I was invited by. Uh, the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies uh, back in 2003 to speak on intelligent design, and they warmly embraced this. Uh, in fact, uh, I think, if anything, many of the uh, young Earth creationists, uh, young Earth creationism is certainly much more popular in the United States than it is elsewhere around the world, but many of the uh, young Earth creationists in the United States uh, do not like intelligent design particularly. Uh, they, uh, they they don't see it as giving a full package deal of uh, a, a biblical understanding of creation. And indeed, intelligent design does not commit you to a doctrine of creation. It commits you to an intelligence that is operating within the world. But that could be uh, could be a process, uh, could be a, a natural uh, teleological process in nature. I mean, and, and there there are philosophical and religious traditions which which treat. Uh, the intelligence, uh, as it were, behind the world is in the world. Uh, Stoic philosophy, for instance, certainly not creationist, uh, did not hold to any, uh, did, did not believe in miracles, and yet uh, Stoic philosophy would certainly be on the intelligent design side. Mm. And, uh, so, I, so I think there are many, many ways of uh, trying to uh, get a handle on, in, on intelligent design uh, from a theological or philosophical perspective that are not, that, that, that do not commit you to uh, any sort of a monotheistic doctrine of creation. Very often, though, when I have spoken about this with others, um, um, they would say, well, OK, presumably, obviously, Bill, you come from the point of view that you do believe God is the ultimate um, designer that, that is behind this process. But they would say, well, that simply just removes the question further back. Um, it doesn't actually explain anything. It puts an end, effectively, to scientific progress because... Um, you're simply saying uh, it's too complicated. I don't understand it. Therefore, God did it. I mean, what do you? How do you respond to those accusations? Well, I mean, the thing is, if you're going to invoke an argument from ignorance, we can that, that argument cuts both ways. I mean, uh, Charles Darwin, for instance, in his age, the cell looked extremely simple, given where microscopy was at that time. He saw it as a blob of jello enclosed by a membrane, and he thought that it could arise by natural forces. So it was his ignorance of the complexities of the cell. Uh, that uh, I mean, when I say natural forces, he thought it could just spontaneously emerge, boom, from from. Do, do you honestly believe uh, and, that? And, and the thing is, I mean, now, now, I mean, the the, the origin of life scenarios. I mean, it's it's much more uh, the, a much more complicated story has to be told in terms of RNA worlds and uh, lots of different scenarios, which then have to lead up to first life. So he thought the the cell could just spontaneously emerge instantly, as it were. So it was his ignorance of the complexities of the cell that led him to that conclusion. And so I, I would turn it around. I don't think it's that we are offering an argument from ignorance. I mean, what you're saying is that basically it's, oh, it's too complex, can't figure out how it happened, so it must have been God. I would say what we do is what we have is we, we, we know a lot about these systems. We know a lot about their complexities. We need to be engineers to understand these systems. We find all sorts of tremendous nanotechnology inside cells. On the other hand, we have no evidence that the causal mechanisms that we find uh, in nature, the undirected brutes, material processes, that they're able to, to bring about the sorts of uh, polymers and the complex uh, bio-macromolecules bio that we need for life. And so exactly. then the conclusion is that it's, it's reasonable to think that, that, these, that the cell is the result of intelligence, at least in part. What, what, uh, one thing, one thing hmm. I think that needs to be clear, we need to be clear on also is that intelligent design does not rule out the effects of natural forces. I mean, just as if you look at a rusted automobile, there's the effect of design, but there's also the effect of weathering. If you look in our genome, yeah, there's a lot of effects of bacterial and viral DNA uh, genetics getting in there, but there's also, we would argue, that there are the effects of intelligence. And, and this is the point that you would argue, that you can certainly maintain a level of information, you can lose information, but you can never create information in the way that um, inevitably evolutionary Darwinian um, theory requires. Well, I, I, would, I would be more cautious. Uh, it, it seems to me that, that, the, that Darwinian processes are very limited in the type of information they can create. And this actually touches on where, where my, my research uh, is, is, is going. It's this, this field of evolutionary informatics that I'm, I've been developing with a colleague at Baylor University, 
Robert Marks, whose expertise is in evolutionary computing and computational intelligence. And what we're finding is that, uh, you see, I mean, I think we often get the sense that if we have heredity, uh, random variation, natural selection, boom, we're going to have interesting evolution. Things are just going to pop out if we could just run systems with those three features and give them enough time. Uh, Ken Miller, who's written the book Only a Theory, makes that point. But that, that is not the case. We can set up systems which have those three features and which do nothing interesting. And this is the point that Stuart Kaufman, a self-organizational theorist, has made. It's that, yes, it seems that natural selection does a lot of interesting things, but it's, it's not just enough to have natural selection. It's working on some sort of fitness landscape. It's getting, the, it's, it's getting information out of the environment in a way that, that, uh, that where, where it's not a complete self-contained uh, theory. And so where is that information coming well, from? What we have mm. found is that, in fact, uh, evolutionary processes, insofar as they're successful, and we conceptualize them as, as targeted searches, which I believe we can do, and we can argue about that, uh, then uh, that, that there has to be information that they are, as it were, front-loaded. And so, in a sense, the information that we get out of evolutionary processes is information that has to be put there in the first place. Mm. Lewis, I'm sure I saw you shaking your head at various points there. <laughs> With anything you'd like to... to, to <laughs> well, first of all, a little question. Do you think, Bill, that chemistry um, is okay, or does that also require intelligent design? Oh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, the thing is, I see it designed all the way down down the road. But let's let let me grant you that uh, brute inorganic chemistry is a given. Okay, and let's let's be. No, I'm interested in organic about, chemistry about but, or inorganic. Let's do inorganic. Yeah, first. I mean, okay, okay, okay. Basically, the basic building blocks. Let me give you carbon and all all yes. the basic things. So then, then you still have to put it together. Now, uh, it seems that we can get. I mean, miller urey type experiments suggest that we can get even basic building blocks of life. But then it's, uh, so the, the adenines, the, the, the DNAs, the bases, the, the, the basic amino acids. But then we still have to put it all together. No, no, I'm not going to try into life. I just want ordinary chemistry, ordinary organic or inorganic chemistry. Is that intelligent design? Uh, On your terms, I, in my... And, uh, it seems well, to I, me, I'm, I'm, what, what is the problem? I'm, I'm, prob- I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to e- evade anything here, but I mean, you are. We, we need to no, because I think what we we have a distinction here, and this is one I make in, in in my books. Actually, it's that if we we can think of a canvas as design, we can think of we can ask whether the canvas is design. We can ask whether the painting on the canvas is design. Is water I, when, it, when, 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 when you're when you're talking about chemistry, you're talking the laws of physics. And chemistry. This is yes. the backdrop against which biology happens. Now, let's leave and biology. I, I want to leave biology out of this. I want to know whether water is an example of intelligent design, and what's the probability of water actually happening? Well, I, I think once you have the laws of physics and chemistry in place, then I think. Uh, oh, but and, once you've got and, them and in you, place, you have, you have, but that's intelligent design already. And, but but the thing is, it seems to me that there there is fine tuning in the fundamental forces and constants of nature, which suggests that there is intelligence even in the laws of physics and chemistry. Oh, okay, I mean, and this is well, I mean, you, you shake your head, or you know, but the, the thing is, this is this is actually widely accepted. It's actually more widely accepted than than design and biology. I mean, you're going to have people like Paul Davies and others who are no friends of intelligent design and biology who are going to be talking, be quite content. Uh, to to talk about design at the level of cosmology. So, so, so they but, think uh, that. But but even even if I grant you, you know, let's say let's be agnostic about uh, design at the level of uh, physics and chemistry. Then the then there's still the question of those the chemistry and physics being coordinated in some suitable way to form living systems. I mean, you'd have to agree that life represents a revolution in the history of matter that is, is structured in particular ways which have nothing, which, 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 where there's a sharp difference in kind from what, what precedes it. Well, Would you sh- at least agree with that? Um, agree with not that? a sharp difference. It's really replication. Yes, of course. That's, that, that's, that's the big difference. The evolution of the cell was the origin of life, and that is not properly understood. There's no point in pretending uh, that, that it is. And you see, what I feel that you don't give enough credit to is how successful the theory of evolution has been in explaining all the varieties that we see around us. But, but, but look at what you've just done. You said, well, nobody understands the origin of life. No. But, and then, then, then you assume that somehow every Everything is fine from there when, once we have an evolutionary theory. But that is the biggest gaping hole yes. with, the whole, with the whole story, getting the first life. 
and, and, and you admit that it has to be the cell, and the very simplest yes. cells are ex- extremely complicated. The no and question. There, so, so you'd be happy with the idea that given the first cell, all the rest is okay? The rest of evolution uh, coming to us is all all right? We don't need well, any I, intelligent I, I, design then? Well, I, I, have, I have difficulties. I, I think that the Darwinian process and various things that have been grafted on it uh, I, I think they, they've got explanatory problems as well. well I mean, the thing is, one, one thing I, I do in some of my research is I actually say, okay, let's say we have first life, then then what what happens with with uh, with the evolutionary process? And I, I consider the possibility that just a purely Darwinian mechanism creates everything. But if it does, from that point on, even then there's there it seems that there will have to be some sort of front loading of information to get the get get everything going. So it's uh, so I, I don't think that this, there's an information problem. Uh, that it seems to me that that uh, Dar- Darwinians often think that they have resolved, but they they really haven't. But uh, but that's but I don't see what they haven't talking. resolved. We're 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 grant you that we don't know the origin of life, but given the first cell, well, we can explain all the rest. Well, I I, I don't believe. I think there, there are two things that are involved. And one is is there a lot of discontinuity in, if you will, bio biological configuration space? I mean, is it is it that that no. the, these evolutionary these small incremental because I think you, you're a gradualist yes I mean you're, yes, you're not, I am a gradualist, you're, yes. not going, you're not going to hold that that uh, new complex forms suddenly no no not at all I'm a gradualist okay. yes okay so it's so so then there's the question I mean so that that's a continuity claim about sure. about life and so is is there sufficient continuity it seems that actually there's 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 evidence that there isn't I mean I I, I would look for instance to the Cambrian Explosion. It seems that there's there's lots of discontinuity in the the, the fossil record in that case, and I think we, there's there's molecular evidence of, of discontinuity. But okay, let's let's say that somehow we're missing something. That there is all this continuity. It seems then that you're still having to navigate through biological configuration space in ways that require some some form of intelligent guidance. I mean, it, and the thing is, I mean, you know, this is actually, uh, I mean, when you when you read somebody uh, like. Uh, what is it? Uh, the, this book, I uh, guess, is focusing on facilitated variation. That somehow it's just not enough to have variation where it's where it's just errors in the genetic code. That it somehow has to be facilitated. Uh, it, biologists, I think, themselves are sensing that there's that there's something missing in in just a brute, undirected way of understanding evolution. I don't know any biologist who feels that, but let me ask you a very different question. Is there any scientific discovery or any bit of information presented to you which would make up give, make you give up your ideas of intelligent design? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think there 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 could there there would be things that could falsify it. I mean, it's the question I posed to you earlier. Uh, it seems that that you you were not willing to admit anything that might might. No, I said no. I said if I gave birth to a dog, well, oh, I mean, no, that, I'd that, really that that, 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 that would be that, quite that, dramatic. That's you know, come on. I mean, uh, I think looking at the mechanisms of evolution themselves, is there anything that cause you that could cause you to question question it, and that that might reasonably uh, that, that that you might actually find. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, in, in my case, I think uh, the, the the whole protein synthesis mechanism, for instance, so that's something that could be accounted for, uh, where you can give a fully articulated, detailed uh, account in materialistic terms of how that thing might have arisen without the need for for uh, some some form of intelligent guidance. I mean, you that, that, that would be very that would be that would be very convincing. To your, me. your claim, though, Bill, is it not that you are simply following the evidence where it leads? You see that there is an inference. That was the title of your your first book. Right. Um, that that you unless you for some reason have automatically excluded any outside creative intelligence for some reason that it's simply that science shows that the inference to the best explanation in the way that we infer design in all other areas of science and society th- why should this be any different is it, do you feel that there's a kind of a materialistic assumption that is at work in the scientific community and th- and that is the main barrier to people seeing intelligent design as a as a worthwhile um, sort of theory well I would go further than that. I mean, it seems to me that there are materialists who are willing to countenance the, the possibility of intelligent design as long as that intelligence is not God. I mean, there was a movie that was, uh, a documentary that was quite popular in the United States 
called Expelled, in which Richard Dawkins was interviewed. And uh, in, in one segment of the, the interview, he allows for the possibility of directed panspermia, where alien intelligence has seeded life or, it, or even put a signature inside the DNA. He, he uses that, that very phrase, signature inside the DNA, uh, and, and, and allows that, that's, that, that, and that would be a design possibility. But the thing is, then he says that that alien intelligence would have had to evolve by standard so, processes that are acceptable to science, which by which he means a materialistic science of the sort that, that Lewis Wolpert has just described. Do you so did... right, right there, he is admitting to the possibility of intelligent design. Francis Crick, he was an atheist, but he allowed for direct defense. If, if life has been seeded, by alien intelligence is visiting the planet uh, with spacecraft, uh, then we are the result of intelligent design. So it's, I think we're, we're, w- the problem is that people in the mainstream scientific community, when, they're, when they are atheistic, is that they're, they're, they're just so allergic to the, to the God possibility that they, that, uh, they dismiss it out of hand. But, uh, but it's, it seems that one, one can't really get rid okay. of design completely. That's I mean, not- I, 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 Let's allow, allow Lewis to just respond there. Yes, I just want to know, do you think that, that because you believe in intelligent design, does this in any way affect how one goes about one's science? Yes, I think it does. Because, in what uh, way? I think, what, I think once you have intelligence in the game, there's a question of how do you tease apart the effects of intelligence from natural forces. But you do your uh, science, but I'm sorry, how would you change the way you do your science? I think one, one thing we would look at is what, what were the original designs conceivably inside the cell and well what that's is, the origin what, of life we what, understand what, 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 but that's what, what people are doing there? that all the time anyhow what, what is been, what has been put there well it's I mean, i'm not using design as just mere structure i'm 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 i'm, 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 I'm looking at it in terms of the, the the effects of actual intelligence making a difference acting for ends uh so and and in the way where the 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 natural evolutionary processes and also the chemical evolutionary processes wouldn't, that, that are usually involved would not be sufficient. I mean, this is, this is something which just surprises me by, by people like yourself, that it seems that there's this, this unlimited confidence that evolutionary mechanisms can do everything, and there's no, no critical reflection on, well, are, can they really do everything? Because, I mean, at, at, at least uh, evolution is a theory of process. It tells us that we can get from point A to point B. Whenever you have a theory of process, you have to ask yourself whether the resources you've given yourself for getting from point A to point B are adequate to do the job. I mean, if I'm at the base of Mount Everest and I need to get to the top, a pogo stick or uh, you know, uh, an automobile, then these are not adequate resources. So it seems one, one can ask whether the resources that evolutionary biology and chemical evolutionary theories give us are adequate. And it seems to me that, so, that, that they're you're, not. You're, you're accusing, in some sense, Lewis, of blind faith in a Dar- Darwinian evolution. Um, but there's more than that. I'm a developmental biologist. Do you really think that we're wasting our time trying to understand how the fertilized egg develops into a human being because there is an intelligent design there which we will never understand? Well... When you say we never understand, it seems to me that, that that's precisely what you are understanding. I mean, uh, embryology, I mean, is, is, if anything, is, is teleological in the sense of... Ooh, what the, do that, you that, mean, that, we you know, understand? Is, 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 is going towards some end. You can perturb it, and usually it, it still tries to get to that end. Or yes. If it enough, it dies. So, I mean, it seems that you have a teleological process there, and insofar as you understand, if it was designed, then you are understanding, as it were, the mind of the designer. Now, I think, you know, you, you, you dismiss that possibility. Totally. But, uh, well... There we go. <laughs> I mean, the, the the concept of teleology, by which we mean some kind of purpose. Some, yeah, sure. I mean, that that in a sense has is the big question at the point of the origin of life, isn't it? Why sure. why yeah. did inorganic, if we do believe in a, a materialistic sure, form of well. evolution, why did inorganic material acquire a teleological, a purposeful kind of progression in terms of replication? There was no. That it doesn't seem to be warranted. No, um, it's just one of those things that happened. It was a rare event, and was really very strange. Yes, I agree with well, you. How, how, when you say rare, I mean right there, you're invoking probabilistic language. How rare? Well, I just cannot tell you how rare. I think the chances of finding <laughs> life elsewhere in the universe are quite small, but I don't know how small. But but what? Yes, yeah, sorry. It's go it's ahead, Bill. Impro- if it's sufficiently improbable, why not say, well? Uh, 
then maybe there was an intelligence uh, involved in it because we do this in yes, but that's avoid other. that's avoiding science. Every time you invoke an intelligent designer, well, no, you're, you're it, giving I mean, up science it, because you say it, we it, can't it, explain it. Is, you, you started out as an engineer. Is, is, is engineer yeah, I did become a science. biologist. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, but engineering is a science. It weds the natural sciences to purpose, and, and so so yes. there. I, I, I suppose what we're how, asking how is, is that, and in fact, yeah. you, I mean, what you do as a scientist would not be possible without the technologies that the engineers have developed. So, I, I, I suppose uh, we're asking why in this particular branch is design excluded when it is the, a, a common factor in any other branch of science and, and explanation. Why in evolutionary biology does design have to be thrown out? Well, it's thrown out in chemistry. Bill? Uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, Christian... I don't know any chemist who would take yeah. seriously the concept that it's all been designed. The, the, the chemists, the, the, the very chemicals themselves, it seems, that if, if there's fine-tuning behind the universe, in a sense, they, they have been indirectly designed, okay? But we can leave that aside. When we, have, when we have objects, I mean, you can take random stones, but if they're arranged in a shape, welcome to Victoria or something like that, even if they themselves are the result of random forces, their arrangements, the patterns which they exhibit, can suggest design. So I'm, I'm not sure why you keep coming back to, well, it's chemistry design. If it is or if it isn't, the, the arrangement... Because no, I don't want a design on that one. Well, you don't want a design. There are lots of things we want, and there are lots of things we don't want, but it seems that the truth of the matter is what should, should guide us. I mean, wasn't I asking this originally, though, Lewis, that you, you, you do have an a priori commitment to... Uh, a materialistic universe, and therefore, no, like I'm you just looking, said, you I'm don't looking, want to design it. No, because I don't have any evidence. What I want is some good evidence for a designer. But you just said you don't want to design it. So no, no, it appears no, no, to me that you're no, saying, no, no, you even if you were the given moment, the evidence, no, if would. I were given the evidence, I would perfectly listen. If God performed some nice miracles over the next weekend, I would really have to change all my ideas. I mean, there haven't been many miracles recently, have there? Bill? Oh, that, that, that's that's disputable. I mean, you talk to people. I mean, uh, many people claim that they've experienced miracles. But the thing is, you well, do you take that? Do you take them seriously? Assume. So it's so. I mean, I mean, presumably, if if you experienced a miracle and then you told your colleagues, if they followed Hume's dictum, then they could not believe you. Okay. Well, no, but so we could you, all experience you a miracle. Would, you personally would be, or is, or is, is, is your reputation does it tower so high that? Yeah, Richard no, no. Hawkins would actually accept... No, no, no. I'd like us to share the miracle, and then we wouldn't have to argue about it, and we'd really have to share. If God came down and actually spoke to us and sort of... Uh, but, you know, but why does why, why does God have to do a flamboyant miracle? I mean, why... why can't I I'm just telling you what I'm asking, just yeah. to give us evidence for God. For someone so all-powerful, it's really weird how he or she hides themselves all the time. Well, it seems that... Uh, that God could be a lot more obvious, but it seems that God could be a lot less obvious. I mean, if, if the, let's say, the Cambrian explosion, if it were not an explosion, if it suddenly, if we saw that there was this, this tremendous, uh, uh, the tree of life was, was perfectly represented in the pre-Cambrian rocks, uh, that would count as evidence against intelligent design, it seems to me. But, uh, you know, it's, it's curious when you talk about evidence. I mean, the, the whole issue of evidence, I mean, what... What is evidence is not decided by evidence. I mean, evidence oh, is uh, what we take to be evidence is, is, is determined by certain cognitive predispositions to take things as evidence. I mean, uh, you know, I look at, I, I see how science operates, how people use these patterns, the specified complexity in a lot of other fields, and it seems that it reliably takes people to a conclusion of design. And then I see this, this fierce resistance among biologists to take that same by parity of reasoning, to take the same sorts of, uh, uh, apply the same sort of reasoning, but then refuse the conclusions that come from, from that. I mean, it seems if, if you're, you look at the cell, you look at the nanotechnology in, in there, I mean, the, the signal transduction, the, the uh, parcels being delivered, kinesin motors delivering uh, packages with sure. that were UPS labels, which, which make sure that everything gets to the right location. Uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when movies would represent the inside of the cell, everything was floating blobs and everything seemed to be just kind of higgledy-piggledy. And now we see that everything is tightly orchestrated. That level of engineering, our best metaphors for the cell are as an automated city, 
if, if we need those metaphors to understand it, why is it such a stretch to think that there could be actual engineering, that there could be actual design inside the cell? We, we need to just take a quick break here, gentlemen, and we'll allow Lewis to, to respond and, and have some final thoughts because we're almost out of time here on the programme. Fascinating discussion thus far, though. Um, is there a creative intelligence at work in biology? One of the uh, foremost um, a, a proponents of intelligent design has been with us on the show today, William Dembski, known as Bill to many, um, and we'll get uh, some details of how you can come across his blog a little later and I'll also put up links to um, anti-intelligent design blogs as well with this podcast so uh, you get both sides of the argument here on Unbelievable that's what we strive to do Um, so uh, also with us Lewis Wolpert who has been uh, critiquing intelligent design and we'll hear more from Lewis in just a moment as well as Bill Uh, do stay tuned here on Premier Christian Radio and don't forget if you want to get in touch and leave me an email um, perhaps giving your point of view on the whole intelligent design um, uh, argument, then do get in touch via unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Welcome back to the programme. Well, uh, just a reminder that later on in January, we're hoping, we're still ironing out the details, but we're hoping to put on a screening in London, central London, uh, of the controversial film Expelled, presented by US actor Ben Stein. It puts forward the claim that those who do propound a intelligent design view of biology are being excluded, expelled, as it were, from the scientific community, from academia, that there is, if you like, a lockdown on anyone who dares to question Darwinian evolution. So um, uh, we, we're still, as I say, uh, looking to uh, exactly get you the date and the venue. But if you check back in the coming week, uh, we'd love to invite you to that screening. So uh, hopefully the details will be up within the coming week and you'll be able to log on. And if you'd like to be uh, come along, um, check out how to do that at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable. Uh, the showing will, of course, be followed by a debate on the issues that it raises. And uh, you can get hold of the DVD, which is being released towards the end of January here in the UK. Okay, well, uh, let's get back into our discussion. Um, Let me tell you, though, next week uh, at the same time, Bill Dembski returns. He, of course, is one of the contributors to Expelled. Well, uh, on a slightly different theme next week, uh, you'll find Bill joins us again talking about his most recent book, The End of Christianity. Um, It's a new theological approach to reconciling the problem of evil with the God of Scripture. It's fascinating stuff, and we'll be hearing from atheist Norman Hansen, who was a Christian but lost his faith partly because of concerns with those who propound a creationist view of the world. I think it'll be a fascinating discussion uh, next week, (laughs) which uh, will involve what's called theodicy, um, how we integrate the God of the Bible with um, the problem of evil. Uh, Meanwhile, back to today's discussion. Discussion. We're talking about intelligent design here on the program. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. Bill Dembski is well known as a key proponent of intelligent design. Lewis Wolpert is a developmental biologist and uh, an emeritus professor of biology at University College London. He's an atheist. Bill is a Christian. Um, We've talked to some extent about how much faith comes into the whole idea of whether there is an intelligent designer. But um, just time to wrap up our programme today, gentlemen. Um, Perhaps we could um, start off with with you, Lewis. Um, you, I'm sure you wanted to respond to some of the things that Bill was saying there about uh, the intelligent design. Well, I'm afraid that what Bill underestimates is just how much we understand about the behaviour of cells. We, you know, we don't understand the origin of the first cell. That's perfectly true. But given the cells and trying to understand cancer and all these things, we have an enormous knowledge. We know how cells produce energy, where the, what food. Are. <coughs> we have a very good explanation. So science has been doing extremely well. And intelligent design, I'm glad to say, has never been invoked in order to solve our problems. And there is no problem that I claim that requires an intelligent designer. Um, certainly intelligent design is, is viewed very askance by the general scientific community, Absolutely. Bill. Absolutely. Um, Bill, is, do you feel that it's gaining any ground? Um, do you feel like people are prepared to listen to the, the arguments you have? Are they throwing it out without really examining the arguments? Is that what you believe? Well, I, I do think we're gaining ground, and I think it's, it's following actually the pattern laid out by Thomas Kuhn in his Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is that the old guard is very reluctant to give up the reigning paradigm and that it takes a new generation. And indeed, I find that younger people... No, it's not a new generation, it's new this. information. 
Well, if we're, if we're talking... Dune wasn't based on a new generation. It was based on actually having new ideas and new I, I, information. I've, I've, read, I've, I've, I've read the book and I've taught the book. I and mean, then if you, if you go toward the end, he describes how new ideas... I mean, he, he cites Max Planck as says that basically uh, a, a new paradigm uh, advances on the graves of the, of the, old, of, of the old guard. So, I mean, it's, it's not just new information. He, he describes... In fact, he puts it in terms of the paradigm shift in terms of a conversion experience. I think that may be going too far. I think there are more rational uh, forces involved in it. But uh, uh, I, I think that... It, uh, it's interesting. The question, the, the question that was mm. posed to me was, mm. am I finding that there is, is more acceptance or at least people willing to consider these ideas? And yes, I do. Although it's, it's not among people like yourself, Lewis. I mean, uh, <laughs> we, we've established that, certainly. Um, do, do you believe, though, in some sense that in terms of that scientific paradigm and, and a revolution, that there will inevitably be a revolution, or, or could intelligent design, as far as we can possibly see, never actually um, become the, the paradigm, which you obviously will believe means that a, a, a false paradigm is, is reigning, you, you, you believe currently. Well, uh, Lewis earlier said that intelligent design is never invoked in all these studies in cellular biology. But, of course, it's in the background because we need to be engineers to understand these systems. I mean, we describe them, and we describe a centriole or a centrosome or the various uh, the kinase and motor molecules or all the different things that are going on inside the cell. It is because we have a, a background knowledge from engineering which tells us where we have, in fact, often invented the types of systems that we see there. And if we haven't invented them, often we take our cue from them, and there's a whole field of biomimetics where we look at what happens in biology and then invent things because... We're so amazed at the clever designs inside biology. So it's so I, I think to say that you know intelligent design plays no role. Of course, it's in the background everywhere in cellular in cell biology. Okay, final thoughts from you, Lewis. Um, and could I start you off by asking: uh, Are you an old the old guard? Are you sort of hanging on to these ideas because they I'm have not been the, the old paradigm? God, I'm the new god. <laughs> And I'm the remaining God. Intelligent design is really an excuse for promoting Christianity, and it has nothing to do with science whatsoever. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today, Lewis. Final few thoughts from you, Bill. Well, I think what, what's at issue here ultimately, uh, and I think that there, there are theological concerns that come up, because uh, just as evolution has been uh, characterized as the greatest engine for atheism, I think that intelligent design is friendly to theism, to some sort of purposiveness behind the world in a way that evolutionary theory has not been. And uh, so I think the the ultimate question here, theologically and philosophically, is is this a mind-first world where mind starts things off, or is mind intelligence something that's the outgrowth of an evolutionary process? And this is there's some very fundamental worldview divisions that are at stake here, and I think you've, you've seen this represented in our conversation today. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. Bill, thank you for joining us as well. And um, we look forward to receiving you back at the same time next week um, as we look at your new book, The End of Christianity. My thanks to both my guests today, Lewis Wolpert as well. Um, and uh, I will put up some links to some information about Lewis with the podcast. Uh, same goes for Bill. If, if people want to find your blog, Bill, um, where, where can they find it? Yeah, uncommondescent.com, or just punch in my name, and it's one of the first uh, references that you'll see if you do a Google search on my name. Okay, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, do join us again at the same time next week here on Unbelievable, the show that gets Christians and non-Christians talking. Naturally, today hasn't been a subject which is, as it were, a particularly Christian, non-Christian subject. There, there are many Christians who uh, have trouble with uh, intelligent design, and uh, I don't want to represent it, as it were, as an atheist versus Christian view of the world. But nonetheless, um, I think it's been quite instructive that we have had Lewis, who obviously does um, come from a background of a materialistic um, uh, view of the universe and, and, and the problems that that I involves for um, intelligent design. Thanks again for being with me. Um, stay tuned. We've got some feedback to previous week's programming coming up in just a moment's time. Unbelievable with Justin Brierley. Well, um, again, just like to mention... If you didn't hear it in the rest of the show, um, we are hoping, uh, lining out the last details, but hoping towards the end of January um, to put on a screening of the film Expelled, controversial film on intelligent design, uh, and it's coming to the UK in the form of DVD release at the end of January this year. 
and uh, we're putting on a screening though and we'll be, you are invited uh, we would like to get as many people along there as we can and um, we'll be having a screening uh, well after the screening we'll be having a debate on the issues that it raises in terms of intelligent design and whether those who propound an intelligent design view are being expelled unfairly from the scientific community from academia and uh, so uh, check back at the unbelievable web page for booking details we're hoping to get those up online within the coming week premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable um now lots of people getting in touch over the last few weeks i thought actually i might take the chances at the beginning of the year to deal with some of the emails that go back a bit further um not particularly in regard to the last few weeks of programming though i will bring your responses to last week's christmas debate uh, in next week's program uh, but i just wanted to look at some of the ones that go back a bit further to shows in the dim and distant past um first of all though carolyn Thank you for your email. You stumbled across the podcast show and listened to the Narnia secret. Uh, that's you can find at the Unbelievable Features page. If you go to uh, the Unbelievable web page, you can actually access uh, a special features section, which brings you uh, a number of documentaries and features I've produced. And uh, this one on the Narnia secret featured um, C.S. Lewis expert Michael Ward on his discovery of an Uh, up till now undiscovered theme running through all seven of C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories. Uh, so do check that out. Uh, you were saying, uh, I was wondering why the show doesn't show up on iTunes in the archives of the unbelievable show. Well, that is something that is, if you like, uh, unique to the web site. So you'll have to go there if you want to listen to it. It, it, it isn't broadcast within the normal podcast. But uh, thank you for your email, Carolyn. Um, Now, someone uh, by the name of Xander, who I think uh, I've read an email from before, uh, said, I recently listened to the archived show Darwin vs. Design. Well, uh, if you want to listen to that yourself, I'm putting a link to it on today's podcast. But uh, Xander uh, says, in, on the whole issue of intelligent design, he feels that there is a way of comparing, if you like, the way that Holocaust deniers go about amassing their evidence with the way that those who support the intelligent design movement um, put their evidence forward. Now, um, you say that you've borrowed this description a little bit from Michael Shermer, um, but you'll do your best uh, remembering from reading a book by him on the subject several years ago uh, what exactly he was saying. Uh, you say historians use various sciences and sources of evidence to come up with independent estimates of how many Jews the Nazis slaughtered, and they consistently come up with somewhere around six million Jews. Uh, whereas the deniers say this is a gross exaggeration, it wasn't systematic, and they weren't killed in gas chambers, etc. Now, true, historians are not committed to a particular viewpoint based on ideology. They're committed to search for the truth. When it comes to the Holocaust, they have arguments and debates and revisions based on new evidence and analyses. Um, in spite of revisions and arguments and debates, virtually all historians agree about the overall picture. It may turn out that fewer Jews were killed at one concentration camp than previously thought, It'll, but it could also happen to turn out that more were killed at another location. And there's no dispute about the Nazis having a concerted policy of genocide and that many of their victims were killed in gas chambers. The picture is the result of independently confirmable facts, not a conspiracy among historians. In contrast, here are some elements of how the Holocaust deniers operate. Firstly, they take advantage of disputes and inconsistencies among actual historians of the Third Reich. This is a pure distortion of reality, since the quotes are taken out of context. Secondly, they try to poke holes in the arguments of historians by saying things along the lines of Why do we not have a written order from Hitler to exterminate the Jews? And there are lots of good reasons why we wouldn't expect to find such a written order. But more than that, deniers don't feel compelled to present a better theory of their own. For example, it can be shown through demographics that approximately six million European Jews from that time period are missing. If the Nazis didn't kill them, where did they go? They don't even bother to address that. And thirdly, you say here, Xander, they ignore the mountains of evidence, which include written documents, eyewitness testimony, photographs, the camps themselves, and inferential evidence. Now, of course, I realise the analogy is not perfect, and it's not correct to make an analogy between the motives. But the analogy I want to make is between the methods, and that's the point. The science has a method which is effective at finding truth and is in stark contrast to methods based on an ideology. And you go on to say that effectively the intelligent design movement proponents are, are doing effectively what Holocaust deniers are doing in terms of poking holes 
in what is overall a very solid theory and not giving their own theory to replace it. Um, uh, so it's, it's an interesting analogy. Um, I mean, as you hinted in your email, the analogy is somewhat loaded, um, obviously such a very sensitive issue, uh, the issue of Holocaust denial, and to compare those in the intelligent design movement, even if it is only in their methodology that you're comparing them, obviously um, they may feel that's rather unfair to use that, that particular analogy. Um, <clears throat> indeed, um, on the, on the, in contrast, uh, if, if you have happened to have seen the film Expelled, uh, Ben Stein, who is himself Jewish, um, really points out the fact that um, there is a link between Darwinian evolutionary theory and the policies of Hitler and the genocide that took place. So interestingly, I suppose one might say there are interesting ways in which uh, these issues cut in different directions. However, it was really interesting to read your email, Zander. Um, obviously, someone like Bill Densky would take issue with the idea that it is just poking holes in what is otherwise an overall very uh, solid theory. Um, I, I think for someone like Bill Dembski, there are simply too many holes for it to be sustainable as a theory altogether. Um, but uh, let's get to some other emails, um, some fascinating insights coming in on other shows as well. This is from Mike Ranieri in Toronto. It says, uh, I love the show, Justin. Been listening with great interest for three years now. It's time you had a proper discussion about free will. It's a big topic, but many people don't understand the issues and just take for granted or assume a position without really considering the complexity of the idea. Many of your guests and you yourself use the free will argument as a defence of the problem of evil. In fact, that was the main argument used by Richard Swinburne when he debated Bart Ehrman on the subject of suffering a year ago. They're both religious, there are both religious and secular free will arguments. For example, in the religious realm, free will implies that an omnipotent divinity does not assert its power over individual will and choices. In ethics, it implies that individuals can be held morally accountable for their actions. The question of free will has been a central issue since the beginning of philosophical thought, from Augustine to Martin Luther's The Bondage of the Will to Plantinga's Free Will Defence and the Molinism of William Lane Craig. It continues to be a debated topic. Addressing this question requires understanding the relationship between freedom and cause and determining whether the laws of nature are causally deterministic. The various philosophical positions take can differ on whether all events are determined or not, determinism versus indeterminism, and also on whether freedom can coexist with determinism or not, compatibilism versus incompatibilism. So, for instance, hard determinists are incompatibilists who argue that the universe is deterministic and that this makes free will impossible. This issue includes the concept of predestination and is also central to the Arminian and Calvinist debate. The reformed free will defence does not presuppose libertarian freedom. Also, if the problem of evil and suffering is the cause of man's free will, must he not relinquish it in heaven? As guest for this topic, I would suggest Robert Kane, editor of the Oxford Handbook of Free Will and any of the authors therein. Robert A. Peterson, author of Election and Free Will, and perhaps Daniel M. Wegner, author of The Illusion of Conscious Will, just to name a few. Well, thank you, Mike. I've always said I really value contributions towards show ideas. Obviously, that would be a very philosophical one, but uh, we don't shy away from, um, you know, quite in in-depth philosophical conversations on this program. And so I'll certainly look into that. Uh, obviously, for, for many Christians, the idea of free will is is essential, if you like, in the idea that we have been created free creatures by God. Now, whether we are actually simply a product of the universe and all the processes therein would make that very difficult to hold up if we really did believe that uh, the, the universe, as it were, is predetermined, is deterministic in that sense. But as you say, other Christians, particularly Calvinists, may welcome the idea of a predetermined universe in as much as they may see that as um, being part of their doctrine of predetermined salvation, that God essentially has put things in motion, everything is under the sovereignty of God, and that free will is, in, a, in effect, an illusion. Um, but thank you for your email, thought-provoking. Miles McLaughlin says, Dear Justin, I'm one of your listeners from across the pond. I catch the unbelievable via podcast. I'm a believer hailing from Lancaster, PA. 
Uh, is that Pennsylvania? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have any major comments about any recent show, but I caught up on some shows from last year, particularly the one with Michael Brown and Rabbi Shmuley. I've heard them both in debate before. Dr. Brown does an excellent job defending the truth of Jesus Christ. Your show featuring them was very enjoyable. I hope you can have them on again. I also listened to your show you had on about Todd Bentley. I think that would be about a year and a half ago now, Miles. Although I did enjoy that show, I wish you had a more discerning voice about Mr. Bentley. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding him, and for good reason. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a charismatic, but I'm not a cessationist either. Without being too judgmental, there is good reason not to be accepting of Todd Bentley's ministry. There's good reason to believe he's a charlatan and a person whose recent moral failings should disqualify him from public ministry. Well, uh, I'm, I, you may be aware that at the time we recorded and broadcast that show, it was, if you like, near the beginning of uh, the so-called uh, Florida outpouring that uh, Todd Bentley was very much part of. And uh, only later on in the year did his uh, moral failings that you've mentioned uh, uh, and some of the controversy around that arise. And so obviously that put a rather different picture on the whole event. Nonetheless, I think that what you can get from that show is, 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 is certainly... Uh, still very valuable in terms of a discussion on the whole issue of the charismatic phenomenon and and different Christians' views on it, and indeed the non-Christian we had on that show as well. Uh, Time for one more email. Uh, This is from Dan Stevenson. He says, I hope you have time to read this. It's quite long, but I have a very thought-out question for you. I recently found your podcast of The Unbelievable Show. I love them. They're really helpful and challenging, sometimes irritatingly so. I'm a passionate Christian and struggle with it because I quite honestly confront myself with the issues brought up on the debates you broadcast. Sometimes I find myself almost overwhelmed by the points made by the atheists on the show, but I keep finding a couple of huge inconsistencies in their lifestyle and belief, which I want to see confronted. I'll posit them like this. A. If we work with the assumption that there is no God, then it follows that we are the highest known order of intelligence in the universe. B. We perceive objective right and wrong, and atheists often complain about the evil done, for example, in the name of religion. C. If there is no God, our sense of right and wrong does not come from God, but from ourselves, by whatever process. Thus it follows that the evil done is not actually evil, but simply something against society's accepted norms. Now, if we are the highest known order of intelligence in the universe, I don't think an atheist is in any position to tell me what I am doing is objectively wrong, because, according to his or her logic, there cannot be such a thing as objective right or wrong. What I am doing will simply be against his or her preferences, and I have every right to do it. And uh, you go on to say that many of the new atheists are suggesting that society would be better off without religion, society could progress. And you say, my question is this, progress towards what? If there is no God and therefore no higher standard of objective morality, which is required to define words such as better, worse, etc., then we cannot progress towards anything as a society or as individuals. Uh, and uh, you go on to, effectively, you're, what you're, you're putting forward is, of course, known as the moral argument, Dan. And something we have covered, and perhaps if you have, are fairly new to the show, you won't have discovered some of the uh, broadcasts, some of the shows that where we deal specifically with this issue or it's dealt with at some point in the show. I, I would recommend to you uh, a broadcast from, ooh, it would be somewhere around May, I think, in 2009, where David Robertson, apologist, took on Paul Orton, an atheist, on this very subject. Uh, it was an interesting discussion to be had there. Um, and I, certainly it's an argument that I've focused in on several times. Uh, and if you follow the show... Uh, and keep downloading those podcasts, you'll see that uh, it's a bit of a pet favourite of mine as well. Um, I think I think it is really hard in some ways um, for atheists to reconcile the fact that their, their atheism does inevitably lead to the conclusion that there are no objective morals, that we are simply doing the things that we feel are right, that we, um, in that sense, um, there, there's no actual evil being committed it's it's just our reactions to it um which are personal and and can vary between individuals between societies through time um so anyway and thanks for your um for your getting in touch with the show really interested to hear your views as well if you'd like to get in touch with anything you heard on the show today you're more than welcome 
to uh, to email me. That's unbelievable at premier.org.uk. If you'd like to phone your comment through, 08456 52 52 52 and select option 5. Uh, perhaps you'd like to respond to the subject of intelligent design that we were hearing about today. And uh, as well, do check back um, on the archive for uh, previous shows. Um, check back, listen back to this podcast, send it on to a friend. It's all available at premier.org.uk forward slash unbelievable and as i've said previously in the show if you check back in the coming week uh, we're hoping to put up details of of what we've managed to sort out in regard to this uh, possible screening of the film expelled towards the end of january this year um, so uh, we'd love to invite you along to that uh, in central london if you're based here in the uk and uh, we would uh, we'd, uh, be following that up with a debate. And, um, yeah, uh, I think a really opportunity to get this issue about intelligent design out into the wider public sphere this January as that DVD expelled comes to the UK. OK, thanks for joining me on this first programme of 2010. And Bill Dembski returns again and at the same time next week. Here's what he's doing on the show at the same time, Saturday afternoon, 2.30 till 4, and online at Premier dot org dot uk forward slash unbelievable you're unbelievable he's going to be looking at the problem of evil and he's uh, written a book recently called the end of christianity you'll find out why he's called it that and you'll see how he comes to reconcile an all-loving god and the god of scripture with uh, the problem of evil and the fact that we do appear to have a history if you like of predator predation of um death how do we reconcile that with the fall, with the idea that uh, sin and death entered at the fall? He's got a really interesting way that he does that philosophically. You want to hear that discussion with uh, former Christian Norman Hansen next week at the same time. Do hope you can join me for that. In the meantime, have a very good week and I'll see you again soon. <laughs>